we uh, went for just a wilderness excursion. You know, that was that was the only thing we had planned uh, to go up to climb Mount Katahdin and then uh, take a bush plane and fly into the Allagash Wilderness. I went on the trip with Jack and Jim Wiener, our identical twins, and a fellow by the name of Chuck Rack. I met Jack uh, first uh, of the two twins. Within a couple days, I had met his brother Jim, and uh, we had struck up a friendship. The house right next door to Jack and Jim became available for rent, so I ended up moving in and was their next door neighbor. Uh, and over the next number of years, uh, we really became close friends. They said, hey, you know, we're planning on doing a camping excursion in northern Maine, uh, and, and you're an outdoors kind of guy. Would you be up for, you know, going with us? Would And I said, yeah, that sounds great. The only real way to get in there was by bush plane. You had the pilot, two passengers, canoe, and half your gear. Jack and I went first and landed on the lake, hitched the canoe from the pontoon. Then uh, we loaded our gear from the plane into the canoe, and Jack and I paddled over to shore. The plane took off and about an hour later returned with Chuck and Jim. We had a good night's sleep the first night at Telos Landing, and the next morning started our canoe trip. Both Jack and Jim, this was their first time ever canoeing. The first day, uh, Chamberlain Lake, we were fighting a headwind as we were canoeing up Chamberlain Lake, and we only made half the distance that we had uh, hoped that we would make and we ended up camping uh, at a place called Gravel Beach near Mud Pond. The wind coming down the lake was just hammering this campsite that we had uh, selected. Directly across uh, a small cove, another campsite was set up, but there were people there. And after a couple of hours of battling this wind, we knew it was going to be an all-night thing, and we just abandoned that site, went across the cove, and shared a campsite with this other group. Uh, they had lost two members of their group, two young boys about 18, 19 years old, who had split off from their main body. And these people were quite concerned uh, because they hadn't seen them for many hours. And they asked if we had seen them. We told them that we had seen them earlier in the day. I think there were two gentlemen who were on the beach. Uh, their kids were out on the lake still in a canoe, and it was up there. It gets pretty black at night, so they were worried whether the kids would be able to find the campfire. So we were all looking for them with binoculars, seeing if we could spot them somewhere. And one of the gentlemen who was uh, on the on the beach with us saw this light. We all turned and looked at it. And it was, it was just a round light, but it was moving slowly at about this speed relative for our distance, uh, but going into the wind. And it was, if you drew a, a direct line from where we were to where this light was, it probably was right over Eagle Lake, where we were a few days later. Um, and it was over the treetops. It, um, it looked like a very, very bright light. It wasn't, uh, it was much brighter than a planet. We looked at it for a very brief period of time because it extinguished itself. And when I looked at it through the binoculars, it just looked like a, uh, a large spherical, uh, round, uh, yellowish white light. But it, I noticed that it had this kind of odd quality to it. It was 
not like the type of light you see coming from an airplane, uh, you know, a wing light or a spotlight or anything like that. And I couldn't quite put my finger on it. Uh, and then after observing this thing for maybe 30 seconds, it just winked out. So then we thought, oh, we'll get back to the job we're supposed to be doing, which is looking for these two guys. And it was a short while later that we saw them, uh, the two young guys from this other group, to set up a campsite at Gravel uh, Beach where we had just uh, abandoned the site. And in the following morning, we continued on with uh, the leg of the trip that we had wanted to do day one paddling as brisk and as hard as we could, we noticed that we were looking at the same bush for like about 15 minutes. So we said, we have to figure out some other way to get upstream. So we jumped out of the canoe, uh, tied a rope to the front of it, and then we struggled against the stream, pulling the canoe behind us. And the following morning, uh, went down to the portage area from Chamberlain into Eagle Lake. And uh, the portage there is just under a half mile, maybe about a third of a mile uh, portage. We managed to transport our canoe to uh, Eagle Lake. We got out on Eagle Lake and there was an island called Pillsbury Island. And there was a campsite that our other party, Chuck Rack, had camped at uh, a couple of years earlier. Uh, called Thoreau Campsite on Pillsbury Island. Apparently, uh, Thoreau had uh, uh, stayed on uh, that island when he had uh, canoed that area many, many years earlier. Well, there was a canoe maybe about a quarter of a mile or so in front of us, and when they went to that campsite. Our alternative campsite was Smith Brook. So we veered to the right and went to Smith Brook campsite, set up our camp for the evening, and uh, discussed fishing at the mouth of uh, Smith Brook where it entered Eagle Lake. When you're up on the Allagash uh, at night, it is so black that you literally cannot see your hand six inches away from your face. That's how dark it is. And, um, I mean, you cannot see anything. It's black. And so if you're going out on the lake, the only way you can find your way back to your campsite is you have to have a, a beacon. We built a large fire and set out for the mouth of Smith Brook. And it took us maybe about 20 minutes or so to weave our way through all the standing deadfall to get to the mouth of Smith Brook. And we had just begun to fish. This was right around seven, a little after seven in the evening, uh, across the lake uh, at our campsite, which was maybe about uh, 350 yards or so. Uh, we could see the fire, which was our only reference point uh, to our campsite, like a lighthouse beacon. It's also very quiet up there. Like you, there's no uh, frog, there's no tree frogs or crickets. Every now, it's just total silence. And every now and then you might hear a loon cry. But if you're downwind from another campsite, you can literally hear people whispering almost. And uh, that's how quiet it is. We just began fishing when Chuck at the back of the canoe uh, saw something and called our attention to it. And when I turned, I was in the front of the canoe, I turned and I looked, uh, I thought, well, that's the moon. The first thing that we saw, the object itself was rising out of the forest. And it was about 200, maybe 250 yards away. The four of us were watching it and it was rising up out of the forest very slowly until it uh, the whole thing was in view and then it just stopped and hovered above the trees. 
My first impression was this was the same thing I saw two nights prior. It had the same quality of light, and uh, this time it was much closer. I mean, we were, I'd estimate maybe 200, 250 yards away, and it was hovering um, above the treetops. Um, I'd say maybe 100, 200 feet. As soon as I saw it, uh, I knew it was something strange. It, it, for one thing, it didn't make any sound at all. Nothing. Not a buzz, not a hum. Absolutely soundless. And it was large. I mean, this, I would, I would uh, estimate that it was probably, uh, uh, I remember thinking that it was as big in diameter as a tractor trailer truck is long. Well, we just sat there for a while, fishing poles in hand, and watched as it approached uh, the trees underneath this sphere. And it was about 15, 20 feet above the tops of the trees. The trees were all illuminated. So as it passed, the light, the ambient light, moved with this sphere. A yellowish white light, almost like a sun. And it it had this weird, very weird roiling effect. It was moving as if it was alive. And uh, in those days, I was studying pottery uh, at Boston University, and um, I, I'm expert at firing kilns. And so when you look in a kiln at about 2,300 degrees Fahrenheit, um, the, the atmosphere inside of the kiln is it's almost like a uh, roiling flux. It's like a... It's like a plasma, and um, it has this life to it. It, it moves, and it, uh, it, it roils, and that's exactly what this thing reminded me of. When it was about 100 yards away from us, I picked up a flashlight, one of those old square battery camp flashlights with a handle. Uh, holding it in my right hand, I put my left hand over the lens, turned the light on, and I flashed an SOS. It was the only code that I knew. Uh, three short, three long, three short. Just to see what response we would get from this light, if any at all. Uh, immediately when I did that, this thing stopped moving. And an instant later, this shaft of light uh, came from somewhere in the bottom of this sphere. With this beam of light coming across the water right towards us, I turned around and I saw that. I did a couple paddles with my hand out the side of the canoe. I looked back again, and this time it was like it jumped in a second. It was like all of a sudden it was right there behind us. It seemed to have just gotten there in a flash. And I could see that the beam of light was, I mean, it was going to get us. There was no outrunning this thing. And I remembered looking back to see where this thing was and thinking, you know, in my mind, it was like still fairly far away. And instead, it was almost right on top of us. I mean, I thought to myself, there is no way we're going to get away from this thing. None at all. And Jack had the same impression. Um, when he was trying to remember what was going on. And then the, the next thing we all knew was we our front of our canoe hit, hit the beach at the camp, and we were aground. And we, uh, we got out of the canoe, and this thing was um, hovering just over the water. It was probably like 30 feet over the water, maybe not even that high. And this beam was coming straight out of the bottom of it onto the water. It was almost like it was sitting on this beam of light. And I remember thinking it was close enough that I could hit it with a stone. If I threw a stone at it, I could, I could hit this thing with a stone. But we just stood there watching it, wondering what was going to happen. I picked the flashlight up a second time and I figured, well, I'll, I'll flash again and see what it does this time. I shined the light at it and repeated the SOS. But this time it began moving away from us. It went to the far side of the lake from where we were and then began to ascend at a 45-degree angle in the night sky. And then it 
it winked out from the outside in, almost like a you know camera iris when it closes, and then it was gone. It was like just vanished. And then this, then we, a, a, an instant later, we saw uh, this. The beam came on again, and it, it 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 this thing followed this beam. It was like it projected this beam out ahead of it, and then followed the beam up into the sky, and. Um, and then it would wink out again. And then a second later, it would come on again, only it would be much further away. So, And it was climbing the whole time. So it gave you this odd um, impression, almost as if it was walking up a staircase. You'd see at one point, and then a further away and higher up and further away and higher up. And then, the, uh, and then it just zoomed away, and it was like a star. And this was only a matter of seconds. This thing was really going fast. There was no sound. There was no sonic boom, no signature, sound signature or engine noise at all. It was totally silent. And in just a few seconds, it was like a star in the sky. And then it, it curved off to the southwest and disappeared over the tree line. And we stood looking in the night sky for a couple of minutes total silence and then uh, in unison the three of us uh, turned and walked up toward the campsite uh, Chuck following when I looked at the fire pit and noticed that the flames of the fire were only this high uh, and I was puzzled by that for you know one reason I was like well the fire's out so I turned to these guys and I said, hey, should I throw some more wood on the fire? This thing's out. They said, forget the fire. We're, we're exhausted. And we all went and climbed in our sleeping bags. And that was it. Well, the next morning we awoke. And the only thing that we were talking about as we were preparing breakfast and breaking camp was this thing that had chased us across the lake. We tried to fig speculate and, you know, well, where do you think it came from? Uh, will there be, you know, what do we do about this, you know? And we paddled up uh, Eagle Lake uh, to the connecting lakes. As we did so, we saw a ranger uh, on the lake. And we hailed the ranger and he came over and uh, we told him about having been chased across a lake by this light. Mm -hmm. And he sort of like squinted his eye a little bit, cocked his head, and then this heavy main accent, he says, well, what you boys probably saw was as Hollywood searchlights. They've got a brand new hardware store down in Millinocket that they just opened up. And they've got them Hollywood searchlights shining in the night sky. Well, from where we were in a straight line of sight to Millinocket was about 90 miles. And an, an obstruction directly in line of sight was Mount Katahdin, which is about one mile high. We returned back to Boston and, and told everybody about this UFO sighting. And uh, we got the usual responses that you might anticipate or expect. And uh, after about a year, had told the story and moved on with our lives. Two years after uh, the Allagash trip in 1978, Jim had gone up to look at this fellow's house. Jim had worked. Uh, as a, an electrician's apprentice and this friend asked him to look the house over as they were walking through the house it was around dusk uh, Jim went in search of a fuse box walked into this closet where he thought the fuse box would be uh, the closet was actually uh, a small landing and a staircase would have taken you from that landing to the basement 
but the staircase was missing. So ja or Jim ended up falling uh, into the basement and landing in a seated position. Uh, when that happened, uh, because of the impact and the compression of his body pushing down, it shoved his brain stem forward and, to strike the front of his skull. You know, I had I had a, an accident in 78, two years after the Allagash incident, uh, which um, left me with these lower back problems. And, and I took some brain damage, which left me with epilepsy. I started having these nightmares. And um, they were getting worse and worse. And, I mean, I call them nightmares, but I'd swear that these things, I was wide awake and conscious when they were happening. Um, but at the time, I could only describe them as nightmares, and um, and and, I, and at that time, there was um, I hadn't made any connection between these nightmares and this Allagash event. I mean, to me, they were just nightmares. But I started having more and more of them, uh, and it started to affect my uh, seizure uh, condition, where I would wake up in the middle of the night and I'd be in this kind of terrified state and it was causing my seizure activity to go up. His brother was simultaneously having uh, 150 miles north and west of us in Vermont. Uh, Jack was sharing his nightmare dreams with his wife Mary and he hadn't talked to Jim at all about these things. The problem was is that they kept recurring over and over again. And it, it was the same intense dream of these non-human entities doing things to me. And I could see their faces and stuff, and it was just totally freaking me out. You know, I was dealing with it. I was going to work and stuff like that. And I just figured, oh, boy, you know, I don't know what's, what this is all about. And then uh, I was talking to Jim, and he, was he told me I, he was having problems with his uh, epilepsy. And I was asking him, you know, how he was doing and stuff because we're real close. And he said, well, you know, I'm not doing good because I can't sleep. And so I was like, well, you know, I mean, ep does epilepsy do that? And he said, well, I don't know, but I've been having these horrible nightmares. And I was like, really? What kind of nightmares? And he was describing the exact same thing that I was having nightmares about. And so the first time they, they did the hip hypnotic regression session with me, they actually had a lot of problems because – when I started remembering this stuff, especially what happened, what I remembered on the craft, I got became very, very agitated, extremely agitated to the point where they were worried I was going to have a seizure again. So they had to keep bringing me out and then taking me back and bringing me out, taking me back. And I did a sketch of it, and it kind of looked like an ant head, if you can imagine what an ant head looks like without the antennae and the, the mandibles. That's how I remembered seeing them. I remembered they were very thin. They had very thin arms and necks. Uh, they were about as tall as we were. Some of them were a little taller. Some of them were a little shorter. Uh, very thin. They wore almost like a skin tight. Um, I remember the clothing they wore reminded me of like skiers clothing. You know, like skin tight clothes that skiers wear. Like a, almost like a rubberized or not really rubberized, almost like a spandex or something. I remember that. Um, I remember some of the you, some of the devices that they had used, uh, but that was all. I mean, I was pretty much in a state of terror the whole time. That was my feeling. While well, every time they, I would try to remember something, all I remembered was these things are going to kill me. I got to get out of here. I remembered a lot in the regression. I remembered that um, when the beam hit the canoe and I was looking up at it, that's when they got us somehow. That light thing was some type of 
transport beam or I don't know what you'd call it. But the next thing I remembered was under hypnosis was lying on my back, uh, only being able to move my eyes. I was like paralyzed, but I could move my eyes. And I recalled uh, looking towards my left and just out of the periphery of my vision, I could tell that the other three guys were in this room with me. But they were like immobile. They were just sitting on this like bench or something. It was something that came out of this wall or something. And that's all I could see. But I knew they were there. And I was thinking, you know, this, there's something really wrong here. And why aren't those guys helping me? What is with these guys? They're just sitting there doing nothing. And I'm over here paralyzed. What is going on? And um, I'm trying to figure out the space I was in, but it was impossible. It was so bright. It was this bright, bright space that I couldn't even see the walls. It was like a fog, but it wasn't fog. It was from these bright, bright lights. And then uh, the next thing I noticed were like these kind of hazy silhouette kind of things coming out of this haze towards me. And uh, there were three of them. There was one on each side and one at my feet. And when, when they got close to me, then I could see what was going on and they weren't human. They were obviously inhuman somethings. And they were just standing there looking at me. And uh, I was freaking out. I mean, I was wishing I could get up and run, but I couldn't move. After what seemed like almost no time at all, I was back on the lake re-experiencing for the first time in probably about 10 years the Allagash again. And as I was regressed, I recalled this encounter and I was extraordinarily agitated, uh, uncomfortable, uh, scared, and uh, in, in total disbelief. I, I didn't even believe the things that I was seeing, recalling, I, they were just too uncomfortable and too unbelievable to accept. We all promised Ray that we would not communicate anything that came out of any of our single, our independent regressions. After being regressed, uh, I, I was shaking. Uh, my head was just like a, a raging river of, of images and thoughts and, uh, and these emotions that were coming up and you know, of, of having seen these beings, uh, of being handled like, uh, like a specimen in a laboratory. Uh, all these things were just really difficult to deal with. After the regression, uh, I, I was totally silent for about the next 24 hours. Um, I came back to the house and the first thing I did was I, I grabbed a napkin. That was the first piece of paper that I saw and I started sketching uh, what I had recalled from this regression. Uh, when I came out of the regression, I was asked, um, well, how do you feel? And I said, I don't know, you know, this is, I, I don't know what to think about all this. They said, well, how long do you think you were regressed? And I, I said, I don't know, maybe 15, 20 minutes. They said, no, nah, you were under for over three hours. It took about a year, a year and a half before uh, Ray and, and Tony Constantino got through all of them. And then one day they called us all and said, okay, guys, this is um, what came out of these regressions. This is what Jack said. This is 
what Jim said, Charlie said, Chuck said. And the only thing that, you know, I mean, there are some details that are different, slightly different, but basically you all have the same story. So, but anyway, they said, look, um, the only thing that we can conclude from your regression testimony is that you guys experienced a, a, an abduction. That the, the odds of four people giving this kind of information independent from one another is the, the odds are astronomical that this could happen by chance. I had told Ray after being regressed that I would not discuss my regression with either of the twins. Uh, they had told me nothing about their regression and uh, Ray had then asked each of us individually to uh, make drawings of what we recalled, which is one of the reasons when I got back to my home, I grabbed a paper napkin and uh, sketched what I recalled the beings looking like as well as their hands, which were unlike ours at all, where we have an opposable thumb and five fingers so we can hold, grasp, and, and do our technology. Uh, these beings' hands were four digits, and they had an articulating pad in the, like the palm of the hand, so they had four opposable digits. All of their technology revolved, well, all the tools and instruments that we saw were used in that fashion. When they would take you by the arm, you could feel these four fingers and this, this grip. After the last fellow, Chuck, had been regressed, had submitted his drawings, Ray um, went over all the material he had received, and then he brought all four of us together for the first time, and then we were all permitted to openly discuss this experience. Ray had laid all the artwork out on this coffee table in front of us, and I was stunned looking at the drawings of my companions and the, the striking uh, similarity. They were, you know, in their own hand, just like your handwriting would be different than my handwriting, their drawing technique is slightly different than mine, but they're the same image. They're the same experience. So uh, I, I thought, you know, it would maybe uh, I have some type of neurological problem, maybe maybe I have a brain tumor. Uh, and that was one of the things that uh, the, we shared in common, uh, that we thought there has, to be, there has to be something wrong with us because this is normal. I mean, normal people don't say this crap. I mean, this, this is stupid stuff. I mean, I don't believe it, but I was there. I'm, I'm seeing their work. It's exactly the same. I was a dual major in college, a photographer and a printmaker, and my direction in education uh, as I was going to college was to become an educator. Uh, after the Allagash, um, I, I became obsessed with an interest in medicine, uh, physiology, technology of the medical investigation uh, aspects, which were things I was un you know, not really aware of. I mean, my interests uh, were shared with some of the physicians, uh, some of the technology, like when the panel uh, that I, I call it a panel, it was uh, a, like a uh, device probably about this length and perhaps this width had come down from above us 
when I was lying on the table in this exam room and my chest was covered in like a curtain, like a physical structure that had edges, defined edges, but it was uh, the same quality and color of light that this shaft of light that came from the bottom of the sphere had. And uh, I mean, you could, you could see through it, but it was, it was like a physical structure. I was talking with uh, some physicians I was working with at the time because right at that time I was doing uh, different types of photography using ultraviolet illumination instead of white reflected light like you would use on your own home flash camera. And I was using ultraviolet film. We were taking photographs of people's body to look beneath the skin to examine the uh, venous structure. And I began thinking about that light that had uh, shown on my chest and discussing that with this doctor. Immediately after uh, that incident on Eagle Lake, um, I started having these uh, very weird, um, I call them insights. I kept having these kinds of things over and over and over again, and and I realized that I could use the processes involved, these these natural processes that occur in nature, in the clay medium, either as a uh, to, as a, a techniques to form clay pieces and um, create surface texture, and integrate the firing techniques all together so that they were all totally integrated. So when I returned, when we returned to Boston, I started working in this vein, trying to figure out how to work these uh, uh, processes of nature into my artwork. And that's what I spent the next uh, two years uh, doing. Before we went to the Allagash, uh, I was in art school and my major was painting and I was a very traditional painter. M landscapes is what I was into. Landscapes and still lives, you know, setting things up, painting pictures, that kind of stuff. It was very traditional. And immediately, uh, in fact, after the Allagash, I never painted again. I never used paint. Immediately after I came back, I became obsessed with um, mathematics and geometry and trigonometry and uh, four-dimensional physics and all this weird stuff. I don't know where it was coming from, Alejandro, but I was obsessed with it. And I started making these constructions out of paper and string and tacks, and it was three-dimensional math. It was all three-dimensional mathematics. And I was folding paper. Um, I was drawing these mathematical patterns that were based on phi, and I didn't. I didn't understand why. I. I was a. I, I. It was a compulsion. I was making these things constantly. I mean, my whole life became obsessed with this mathematics. I became. Uh, obsessive compulsive about uh, ancient temple architecture. Um, somehow I had it in my head and it, I don't know where this came from, but I just uh, became obsessed with the, with the belief that ancient temple sites were actually macro chip technology, that they had, they functioned as macro chip computer, like almost like a computer motherboard and um i've been and i just became obsessed with this and i and i'm still obsessed with it <laughs> after our regressions uh we were taken individually for a series of polygraph tests and they were given by a man who by the name of ernie reed who was a uh, polygraph expert for the Massachusetts State Police Department. He had formerly been a polygraph uh, technician, an expert 
for the FBI. And when he retired from working with the FBI, he worked with the Massachusetts State Police. Um, Ernie uh, ran us through uh, the polygraph hurdles and obstacle course. And after we finished uh, our exams, he said, well, I, I said, well, what do you, you make of this? He said, well, looking at the results, he said, uh, you're, you're being earnest, you're being forthright, and, you know, you, you've passed this polygraph test. Maybe a year or so later, had been invited as guests on the Joan Rivers television program, and they brought a polygraph expert up from Washington, D.C., that did work for the Secret Service through whatever connections that Joan Rivers program and tech people had. Um, and we had another polygraph exam. And we went on this program and uh, Joan Rivers was going on about uh, our polygraph exams and our experience. She was an incredibly receptive individual, uh, which surprised us. Uh, she was a very gracious woman uh, and very deeply interested, uh, or she projected that to us, very deeply interested in our experience. Uh, she had a copy of the book, which we had never seen, and we're like, oh, wow, hey, there's the book. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, after that, uh, you know, we had, uh, you know, I didn't tell anybody that I worked with that I was going down to the New York City to be on the Joan Rivers show. My boss knew, one of my co-workers knew, because I, I didn't share this with anybody at work, because I worked in a, a medical teaching hospital we were affiliated with Harvard Medical School, BU Medical School, and Tufts School of Medicine. And this, these are some of the most prestigious medical education uh, facilities in the United States. And, you know, these people are really like straight-nosed, no-nonsense. And so I didn't want my experience to be shared with them because I was already uh, accepted as a professional, treated as a professional, and my work was very professional. So there I am, there we are on Joan Rivers' show, uh, sharing our experience. Unknown to me was it was a live television broadcast. And at the hospital that I worked at, they have television sets in all of the patient waiting areas in the lobbies. And boom, there I am on the Joan Rivers show. My coworkers see me. Within minutes, every television in patients' rooms where there were no patient, the nursing staff, the medical staff, engineering, housekeeping, every, I mean, every section of the medical facility I worked at was now aware of Charlie Foltz having a UFO encounter. So unknown, I come back to Boston, I go to work, and I had probably about 10 guys, or employees, all veterans, uh, many of them in the Air Force, all come up to me and share things of high strangeness that they saw while they were in the service. 